Okay, so I guess that it's time for me to start. And I was a little bit worried that I will have a huge audience. It would have been the largest, but uh, this is manageable. This is what I'm used to. Um, my name is Daniel German. I'm a university professor. I work at the University of Victoria in the other side of the country in Canada. And, and this is work that I've been doing with, um, with Kate Stewart from the News Foundation and Bram Adams. Uh, he's also a professor at the Polytechnique of uh, Montreal. And, uh, and the work that uh, I'm going to describe today, and um, it's this combination of uh, research plus hacking. And um, it has been quite fascinating and interesting. Um, so uh, many of us use Git. Uh, Git is uh, one of the big contributions that the Linux kernel has. Um, it will also, it seems to be having a huge impact not only in software development, there are many, many, many other areas where people are using Git uh, for version control. So it's a fascinating technology. I don't think I have to tell you why it's good and uh, what are the benefits of, of using Git. Uh, the fact that it's pervasive and people are using it is proof enough that it's an uh, excellent tool. And, but one of the things that's fascinating about Git is it's a great archival uh, framework for historical information. Um, the way that Git works, essentially you give it uh, files, blobs in Git uh, um, lingo, and it will just put it away and put metadata on it. And then uh, you can, at the very least, extract them, extract them back, or you can do some comparisons with it, and, uh, which is quite actually uh, useful. And that's the notion of being able to use diff. If you have a diff that is able to understand the data that you have, that you'll be able to see some interesting uh, differences between one version and another version of that file. The typical use case is like, what are the changes between the last version, the previous version, and the one today? And, um, and uh, for that reason, then uh, Git is extremely good at operating at line level. And uh, at line level, then it has all the infrastructure. It's a little bit aware of uh, some uh, program constructs and uh, particularly with C. But in general, it's, it's, it's agnostic to the programming language that you use. And that's actually why people use it in, in many different things. And one aspect that people love about uh, Git is also the ability to do uh, blame. And uh, so you can say, you wrote this, or this is the commit that introduced this change. And uh, this is a screenshot um, using the GitHub interface and um, for uh, Git blame. And, uh, and this comes from a file in the Linux uh, kernel. So it can actually tell you for each, one of, for each line of code and uh, who are the uh, authors or the commit IDs that introduced that change. And, uh, but the main restriction is that it's basically line-based. And um, but it's sufficiently good for most of the tasks that we have. And, uh, because, but because of that agnosticity, then people are using it for other domains. So it's actually very, very common now for authors of text, of documents, uh, to use version control. Uh, with my collaborators, with my students, we write papers using uh, Git. And, uh, and it's great because uh, you can do the same kind of activities that you will do with, um, when you're doing uh, software development. You can roll back, you can blame, uh, you can uh, branch, you can merge, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But one interesting aspect that made Git very different from any other version control systems is its malleability of what history is. Uh, essentially, um, Git allows you to write the, hist the, the clean history that you want others to see, which might or might not be um, very true depending on uh, the practices that your particular software development team. And uh, so there are lots of tools dedicated to writing history, and it's extremely powerful. And we're actually using some of those tools to do some of the work that we are going to present today. And uh, so with the proper motivation, you can essentially change the history of possibly to be whatever you want it to be. Of course, in the process, you might annoy some of your collaborators. <laughs> and uh, try git rebased and then push to master and, uh, and then people, that will actually get some comments. Or you might just do it, uh, which is the typical use case, uh, you clone your software, your, your project, you do your work, you work maybe for uh, one week, two months, three months, 
uh, you get your commit, some of those might be more like backups of your work, and then you say, now I'm finished, I'm done, and you're going to rebase some of those to make them look cleaner and nicer for the people who will be in the future maintaining them, or in the case of the kernel, who will uh, review them. Um, so um, I love this quote by, in, um, by Indiana Jones, and, uh, because part of my work is finding interesting uh, research data to work on. And uh, so I see a lot of the work as I do as, as similar to the one of an archaeologist. So I'm a software archaeologist as one of my uh, research uh, fields. And, uh, and it then just said, archaeology is a search for fact, not truth. And, uh, and all, I, all we can know is whatever is the fact is, fact is that the history that the developers have left for us is recorded. What really happened, we have no idea. And the more facts that we have, the better we can interpret that history. But unless they record every single train of thought, every single uh, activity that they do, we will just have a misguided, um, um, uh, not misguided, but incomplete history. And so the history in Git, uh, no matter what project you have, is, is likely to be incomplete. So what can we do with it? So with these constraints, uh, is there information that we can extract from the history of Git that is a little bit more uh, fine-grained and complete than the one that uh, blame by line does? And uh, so we have a dream, so we talk a, a little bit about this. So Kate, I've known her for uh, four years. Uh, we talk uh, in... Um, Linux in Japan and uh, in December, was December? December last year. And about some of these interesting uh, needs that we had for being able to go a little bit more fine grain on, on um, the kernel. And um, so we talk about a little bit what was that dream. So uh, this is a function from the Git project. Uh, so I will, uh, when we try to understand how to extract history of Git, we decided to use Git because if Git uses Git, it's probably the best user of it. So it kind of this recursiveness, I just like it. Kind of uh, Richard Stallman is. And so that's, that's the blame. So that's the typical blame that you have. So um, how accurate is the history of that function? Uh, you can, you, you, if you trace the history back, you can, you can go to every single commit that is mentioned. You can look at the commits before, and the commits before, and the commits before. But it's a little bit tricky, and there is no real infrastructure to be able to uh, traverse that history at a more fine grain level. So let's look at this particular line of function. Uh, line. And uh, so uh, Ramsey Jones is the one who um, added it. And let's assume for a moment that we're able to actually take this source code and uh, this function. And we're able to actually pass it through uh, some sum of filter. And we create uh, this tokenized version. So essentially, every single one of these lines becomes a token in the source code. Uh, most of you are programmers, so think of a token of whatever definition of the programming language it has. And so the brace will be a token. Uh, equal, equal will be one token, even though it's two characters. We consider string to be a token. Um, it was an interesting question. So what, what about comments? Are comments just a bunch of words or are they one token? Well, for the, for the purpose that we have, we decided that a comment is just one token. Because otherwise we get into more tracing the evolution of the comments in the source code. Because comments are also huge. So let's assume that we have this. Will it be possible that we can actually go from the history per line to history per token? So the one below is the history per token. So we're able to actually see at a far, far more grain uh, detail what are the actual, com the actual commits that we show of the token. So let me actually uh, run you through an example in this case. So we have our original line. And those are the, uh, the, the, the same tokens that correspond to that line, OK? But instead of one change, we're actually observing that there are uh, several changes here. So they're actually. Uh, uh, three commits involved. And let me colorize them. So uh, the pink part is actually uh, originally authored by Linus Torvalds. Well, we don't really know whether it was him or it was a patch from somewhere else. But it's so much in the past that we don't know anything else about that. Okay? And uh, then the actual word commit comes from uh, Ramsey, Ramsey Jones. And then the blue part actually is the struct a commit. And the, the parentheses and the semicolon also comes from Linus Torvalds. 
So when you trace the history of this, what happened, what happened is that the original line was authored by, by Lino, so the pink line. And then it came the blue part. And then at the end it came the yellow part. But which, who is attributed to the line? The last modifier of the line. So in this case, that's why Ramsey appears to be uh, the one who have, is supposed to have actually modified that line, or modified that line last. Well, uh, in this case, uh, three other commits are ignored. Uh, in this particular function, uh, the green part is parts that are wrongly attributed using blame. So if you look at the blame per line, they're attributed to different people that the true author, if you're able to see them by, by a token. So that was actually a problem. So this was a goal. So we wanted to be able to do this. Whether it's good or not, that's a different story. It's, it's about a, a ability. Maybe at the end we will find that there's no difference that the token and the, and the line are mostly identical. So that was actually maybe, that's something that could potentially happen. So we started thinking, and we came up with, with uh, what we're calling the evolutionary views of VC repos. And let me actually uh, run you through the basic idea. It's relatively simple. So we have a file, and if you have a filter of that file, that creates another file. It's very simple. Think of even a cat will be a trivial filter. And uh, in this case, the filter that we're using is the one that is responsible for doing the tokenization of the file. Okay? Now, when you have different programming languages, then you have to deal with different tokenizations for each one of them. I think that at this point, we, are, we have been able to deal with uh, Java and uh, Python. C++ is a little bit trickier. C++ is harder to parse and, than, um, than uh, C. And of course, we don't want to have a full-blown parser. It's an overkill, and then you have to be able to compile the code at the same time. So we're using what the researchers call island parsers. Okay? In fact, uh, we're using a, a, a tool called SourceML from University of Kent. So this is what we do. So we take the original source code, and then we pass it through uh, this filter, and uh, based on this parser uh, by, uh, by Kent Univer uh, University of Kent, and then we generate the, uh, the version of the right. So that's actually our, our fundamental view. So think of it. So for every version of every file that ever appears in the Linux kernel, we do this. Okay? That's not difficult. Uh, and any student can actually do it within a couple of days. It will take some time to do the tokenization of the kernel because it's massive, but it's not actually difficult. But then we have to uh, bring it to the next level, which is the commit. So for every commit, for every file that is in every commit, we create the view of this. Okay, so it's just recursively we're going one level. And you see where I'm going? So our purpose is to create a repository in Git so this is actually, so if we have our original repository in Git, we want to create a view repository. So we're using Git to exploit the history at the token level of the history store already by Git, okay? And uh, so what our, our, our goal is that if you give me a repository, I can create you another repository where you have the, um, the history by token. And then you can use all the infrastructure that is already in Git to be able to traverse that history, which is, for us, the most important blame, okay? At least in this case. So the, this is actually uh, uh, the, what we have been able to do. So this is a file in Git. So uh, look at actually the, the, uh, the blame. So this is just a traditional blame. Sorry, uh, this is just the list of commits, the last commits of a particular file. And these are the, la the, the list of commits in the token version of the file. So notice that the metadata is the same, except that the committer is different because I'm the one uh, doing those commits. And, uh, but that's the goal. That essentially, we have a topologically identically, uh, identical repository. And for each one of the commits, the commits uh, is a, a, a view of the original commit. And all the metadata matches except for the, um, the committer. Okay? So, and then we're able to do uh, blame. So uh, this is actually using the GitHub inf infrastructure again. So the one that I show you in, the, in, in, the, um, in our dream, um, that's actually, uh, uh, I, I create those slides extracting the data uh, from Git using the GitHub uh, infrastructure, which is actually the beauty of this. By staying within Git as the storage, we're able to use all the tools that they are around 
to be able to exploit it. So we don't have to build our, we don't need to have a special database with a special web server that allows you to browse that history. Um, so for example, if you have this commit, so this is just a traditional commit uh, in, uh, in, in a file. And I noticed that already GitHub gives you a little bit of an indication that even though this is the line, it highlights the token. Git blame allows, uh, sorry, a git diff allows you to do that. It's actually uh, relatively trivial if you're dealing with a line. When we do the tokenized version, we actually see that there is actually this removal and this addition. So the replacement of that. And notice that the metadata is the same. And on top of that, we actually link uh, with the commit ID of the original commit. So when you're browsing the history in the tokenized version, you can quickly jump to the original one. So you can see what the commit is there. So let me actually now uh, come to uh, the, the Linux history part. So um, the history is, is stored in three different eras. So if, uh, of course, uh, September 1991, the very first zero, uh, version 0.01, zero, uh, zero uh, that's what we are celebrating the 25th anniversary of the Linux kernel. And uh, until 2001, when BitKeeper started to be used, there's no version control of the kernel. It's interesting that some teams uh, started to use version control. You see still some archives of, of uh, CVS repositories where the top teams use version control to do their development. But uh, Linus never liked CVS. He will never actually accept it as a version control system. So he will just receive patches, apply them. And then using Usenet, Usenet became the, 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 the repository, the way to distribute the code in that era, okay? So um, Yuan uh, Padillo, uh, he did a lot of work to try to, uh, to retrieve every single version he could and then commit it into a Git repository. So we have a prehistoric, I call it prehistoric uh, Git repository that has just uh, snapshots. Of course, all the commits are associated with one person and there, there's a very long, long period between uh, each one of these uh, commits. So the history is not very fine-grained, okay? We call it, uh, um, um, sorry, and always the committer is uh, Linus Torvalds. And then in 2001, uh, uh, BitKeeper started to be used by Linus Torvalds and um, they, uh, at, until 2005. And you know, that's a, there's a very interesting story before, behind uh, why uh, stopping using BitKeeper and, the moment that Git is born. And of course, uh, we're here so we know that uh, Git is born specifically to satisfy the needs of Linux Torvalds for uh, version control in the kernel. So between 2001 and 2005, the history is stored in BitKeeper logs, and, uh, and Thomas Glexner, uh, he uh, did the work to extract that and put it into a Git repository. Okay? And, uh, and then in 2000, 2005, uh, Git starts to be used and becomes the version control system that we have today. Because of that, so we have really, really, really a uh, very uh, low granular, uh, it starts to improve, and then here we have far more fine grain. And as more teams start to move to Git in the last 10 years, we start to have a more fine grain view of the code. Um, it's quite interesting to see, uh, as a researcher, to see the different uses of Git in different teams. Uh, in Git, every commit is kept uh, uh, through, um, um, through, the merging, uh, uh, through the merging process until it arrives in Linux. Uh, the, 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 the commits as they happen, they are maintained. There are projects uh, like the Postgres that does not have a single merge. They say, you finish a feature, you squash it, and we will commit the squash at, ma at head of master. So therefore, all of those micro history you have, I don't care for that, because I just care for the feature. The Linux kernel is different. The Linux kernel actually maintains all of that. Of course, um, we have also observed that there are cases where people develop drivers, for example, outside, and there's a person that comes in and imports all of that in one single mega commit. Okay? So that still uh, affects a lot of the granularity, but that's actually, uh, that's more observable. So uh, the other nice thing is that Git actually allows you to concatenate repositories of common history and uh, uh, using uh, feature called grafts. And um, so it's, 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 we, be, we were able to use these repositories and create one single big repository that's able to track the history of the files all the way to uh, 1991. 
And there's some interesting features of, of Git that also make it very, very good for, uh, for history analysis. One of them is the ability to detect renames. It's configurable. Uh, you can configure uh, uh, how hard it has to look for when a file is renamed. But even if the file is, is slightly modified in that rename, it's able to actually say, oh, this file moved from here into there. And it's only 97% the same file, which is quite valuable for the kind of work that we have. But however, there's actually, there are some big warnings that I want to uh, uh, address. So one of them is that in the, in, in the nomenclature of Git, we have the concept of the author. And the author is a very, very strong term. I, I prefer to use the term contributor of the commit. This is the person who is giving the commit. This is uh, providing the, the, the code. Might have been the author or might be somebody else and he's just an, a conduit to actually put it into version control system. Or in other cases, this person might be doing some refactoring and might be taking code that was authored by some, somebody else and put it in a different location or maybe do some extra modifications. In that case, the true author of that code is a combination of different individuals. What we are tracking here is the contributor of the code, the one who's actually providing. And of course, uh, the uh, Git blame is not able to really deal with uh, refactorings. In fact, it becomes a very interesting uh, issue and, and, and even topic of, of, of research. Um, when you refactor, who's the true author of the code? That means that for every, for every uh, chunk of code, you might have that this code actually comes from many different individuals with different proportions of participation within that. And, uh, and I don't think that even uh, lawyers are sure about what exactly that means. So uh, here are some statistics that provide information about this. So um, this is up to version 4.7. The left-hand side is uh, the slugs. And uh, the right-hand side includes the, um, the size by tokens. And uh, you can see that it's around seven, uh, six times more uh, the number of tokens and uh, the number of lines. And um, the kernel reports, they just use plain lines. They don't even use the concept of slug. They just count with WC how many lines it has. And uh, when you divide it, actually the number of blank lines in the kernel is relatively significant. It makes sense because we use blank lines to divide uh, code. And, um, and when we break it, as I mentioned before, comments, we keep them uh, separate. We keep them as just one single token. It doesn't really matter how long it is. That actually means that we're not able to trace uh, the, the, the provenance of the tokens, sorry, of the comments. And, um, but, but if necessary, we could actually do that. Um, one of the things that interests me to, it was, can I see what code has survived from that very, very first version, 0.01? And, uh, and it happens that this function, skip a toy, is the function that contains the most code from its very original version. Okay? There are not many functions that survive, but this is one of them. It kind of makes sense. A toy uh, converting strings to uh, integers. This is that function in the original kernel, okay? And uh, if I show you the version that we have today, uh, you will see that there is the static, that, uh, sorry, the no inline for stack. And, uh, but there's something very fascinating happening here. So um, notice this and this. Let me show you the original code. It was a while loop. Somebody in 2015 decided, well, discovered that every time this function is called, it's always called with the first character being a digit. And therefore, the condition was not necessary. I assert that for maintainability, that's a bad decision, okay? For the strife of pure speed, this person decided to submit the patch. So that's the patch. Rasmus, in 2015, decided to change the while loop into a do while. 
But of course, if, so this is actually a tokenized version, and um, this is what I was mentioning, that we are not able to uh, trace at this level uh, the, the move, because this actually you just move the wild from the top to the bottom, puts the bread from one side to the other, uh, but in terms of tokens, still uh, uh, the same. It's actually something interesting because now that we have that level of granularity, we can go through every single one of these changes and see when these kinds of moves happen and create an extra link that Git doesn't provide. I'm tempted to revert this change. Some of you know, like the corners, like, like in you find in this church that this place is still from the original, very, very first church that we built. So to, to, to uh, undo this change, to bring it back to this function was like in the very, very original version of the kernel. And uh, this is actually the closest we have to that. Uh, there's another file that's actually quite interesting. Uh, this is the file that remains the most as in the very first version of the kernel, okay? And uh, if you program in C, it's essentially just a data structure to uh, implement uh, 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 the macros for determining the type of uh, character, okay? Uh, notice actually who the owner of this code is. Uh, Andre Rosa, so uh, appears to be the, 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 the author of that big data structure. And um, although the comments, uh, they appear as Linux. So one, one interesting thing, so this is actually using GitHub. Uh, in GitHub, the history is not concatenated. Remember I talk about the three eras? In here it's not, so that's why Linux Torvalds 2.612 appears to be the moment where that comment was added, even though it comes from way uh, before. Um, let me show you uh, a little bit of what we are able to do now. So uh, this is the output of, that we're able to generate. So. Um, Providing blame per line is very, very nice from a user, point, user interface point of view. You put the line on one side and the blame on the other. Providing blame by token, it's a, it's a nightmare, okay? Because how do I show it? Well, in this case, I decided to, to colorize according to who the author is, and then if you stay long enough in a character, it will tell you who that is, okay? And uh, so look at that. So that actually comes from the pre-git times and, uh, and it dates from the very first version of the kernel, okay? And uh, uh, that's the only code from this person, from Andre, who actually added to this file, that, the real code. And uh, because let me actually just scroll down, we'll actually see that there's nothing else. I also, we also had a summary. So in this case, you can actually see that uh, pre-Git, 585 tokens. Arnaldo, who added uh, uh, one of the, um, uh, one macro at the top and at the bottom, the export symbol, uh, he added seven. Sorry, at the, at the top, he added an include. So he has a, uh, an include. Probably he added include with some file, and then the person later came and modified the actual file name and changed that name. And, uh, and then Andre has one. So Andre has one token in this file that was almost the original one, okay? So why, what happened? Anybody has any hypothesis? This is the original file, okay? Notice at the bottom all of these uh, zeros. So let me go back to the, the new version. The new version has all this uh, piece down, down here. Uh, all these pieces down here. And the original file has zeros, okay? But if I search for tabs, so when he committed the code, he replaced the tabs with spaces. Who becomes now the owner of the line? He did, okay? So this process actually allows us to uh, be able to discover these uh, situations. And uh, so, uh, this case, then, as I mentioned before, so uh, pre-git, 585. In fact, you can actually see it here, so uh, the, the actual commits. So we have the, the original one is uh, 494 tokens. Then uh, at some point in 1996, 
these were replaced, so these extended characters. Uh, one interesting aspect is that the piece were added, but these little commas are still are from the original one. And it brings a very interesting aspect. So when we look at the history of code, if you have a semicolon that you, you left there from the original function, but you didn't have anything else but your semicolons, are you still creating a derivative work of that function before? <laughs> um, semicolons might be uh, an exaggeration, but uh, what about if some of those names are still there? And uh, so some, some very interesting aspects for, for that. And um, anyway, so that's kind of uh, an, exa uh, an exaggerated case. Um, of course, the question, the question that I get asked all the time is, does it matter? This is the proportion of code according to the year when it was created, as of version uh, 4.7. So for example, uh, this means that 50% of the code was written around 2010 or before, OK? Notice that lines and tokens are almost the same. When you start to aggregate data, you, well, some people win, some people lose, and at the end, almost looks identical. Yes, the tokens is a little bit higher towards the past, so we have more surviving code from the past, but overall, it's almost identical. Okay, I was surprised by this, so I thought, uh, that might be because there's a lot of people that add drivers and, uh, and, and architectures into the kernel, and they probably have very few authors. So I thought, let's go to an area that I know that there's far more activity, kernel. Yeah, it's a bit better, but <laughs> not that much, okay? It also tells us very interesting stories because here it tells you that most of the code that, that, uh, uh, from uh, 2007 and before, yeah, there still survives, but they're just remnants. And then the code really starts, uh, survives over a very long, long period of time. Of course, code gets replaced. But it's not surprising because the kernel keeps growing and growing and growing, okay? Um, these are some of some uh, tables of uh, people. Uh, as I mentioned before, pre-git is everything that happened in that prehistoric part of uh, um, the, uh, the kernel. So there's still 5.5%, sorry, 5.1% uh, number of tokens predate the use of BitKeeper. And uh, if we do it by line, if we concatenate the histories, it's 3.81. So but you recover a little bit more data uh, from the past this way. Essentially, the numbers are the same with two exceptions. Arndt and Joe. What happened is, particularly with Joe, Joe is a person that has been very uh, surgical doing global replacements or adding macros in front of the declarations of functions. He doesn't have that much code added, and yet the kind of modifications that he makes are small, but he gains lines in the overall con con uh, 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 counts. And he also makes changes to functions that have been already uh, kind of finished, and they don't require mo modifications later. And, and on the other hand, then Aaron, then uh, he's in the other, in the other side, that his changes uh, have been uh, slowly been uh, overseeded by other people modifying the same uh, lines. But it's quite fascinating because it tells you that, yeah, so it doesn't really matter what method you use, the top 20 uh, contribute around 20% of the kernel, according to uh, the git logs. So what about the kernel, the kernel directory of, of the kernel? <laughs> and uh, the numbers are very similar there too. And um, in fact, all the 20 are the same in the other, just they use shift positions two or three locations. They're not that different. Uh, which, I have to say, I was very surprised. I was not expecting that. I was expecting a little bit more variability, particularly because uh, the files are heavily modified. And uh, in fact, if I, let me actually go back to you. Um, this file is not very interesting, but let me actually just open uh, the other file. So this is uh, bsprintf. And let me just scroll quickly through it. You can start to see all the colors that we have. And you, for example, you can see the, the, um, the aggregates of each function, so how many uh, tokens each one of them has. And of course, you have functions that have fewer authors. 
And interestingly enough, as you st start moving down, so this is actually a, a function with a lot of different authors. When you start moving into, into the present, uh, let me just move towards the bottom. So you start to actually see uh, functions with less authors. So here, for example, and um, where's the Jogo data three? Should be the other way around. I have something wrong here. Oh no, Joe is actually 83, so why do the colors appear wrong? Anyway, my interface is a little bit iffy in these cases. And um, so notice that this function is also too, so we have a huge number of tokens by the same author, okay, Daniel Bodman. So as, as uh, that's kind of expected, as new code comes in, so this is actually one by, uh, uh, the last meal, and uh, so as, as, as the function grows, the code gets added to the bottom, so the top ones will have far more people involved than the bottom ones that will have less. <clears throat> um, there are other aspects, so uh, many, many small changes. This surprises me too, particularly as a researcher. So in here I'm counting non-merges to modify C and H files, not assembly. So in fact, as, as something I should have warned before, I'm not counting assembly. Assembly is already fine grained enough. And 9.5% um, of the commits added three or less C tokens and removed three or less C tokens. Uh, from my experience, that basically tells me that there are bug fixes or some specific things to actually uh, uh, deal with uh, compilers. And 3.8% um, added one token and removed one token. It's like a surgical operation. I didn't touch anything but just one single token that I renamed, okay? But at the same time, we also have these huge additions, as I mentioned before, of people who say, here it is, there's all this code with no extra history. Uh, one of them is a, fi uh, a file system. I don't remember the name. Uh, one, more than one million tokens. Uh, oh, sorry, sorry, this is, a, sorry, sorry, let me rephrase. Um, uh, in the two commits added one million tokens and removed more than one million tokens. And it's just code moving that Git is not able to detect with the default parameters. So uh, they decided to actually move them from one location to another and uh, in Git uh, without properly fine tuning the, um, the, um, the moving detection. It just says there's this huge movement from one side to the other. Uh, churn, so that's actually a definition that we tend to use a lot of in academia, is uh, tokens added minus tokens removed. And uh, so in this case, there are two commits that they have more than one million tokens. Uh, one of those is a file system. So the file system was completely added. Another one is a driver. There's no history on those parts, and they just were added in just one single commit. And, uh, but still, you can see that 48% um, of commits had a churn of less than 10 tokens. So that's kind of, you can see that as the growth, the absolute growth in terms of number of tokens after that commit actually happens, okay? And 26% and have negative churn, and uh, which actually goes very well. So we, um, Manny Lemon, and um, passed away recently, um, you say that um, for systems to, um, to stay, um, to satisfy the needs of their, um, or of the users, there has to be, there, there has to be an, uh, the, the, their team has to uh, put up a good effort on making sure that, um, that um, the system is maintained. And, uh, and, and I think that uh, this basically says there's a lot of cleanup, a lot of activity that doesn't really, is not even reflected, because when you have negative churn, you don't even count in the counts of, of lines. You're removing, you don't count when I count you in, in the previous slide. And that's part of the reason that uh, in the Linux kernel report, I, I, I presume uh, commits are used more as a metric of effort because uh, counting tokens as a, as, as a metric also has huge um, uh, potential um, threats to validity. Um, so in conclusion, so um, on the large, token and line are equivalent, at least for the kernel doesn't seem to be much difference. Uh, on the small, they provide a very uh, interesting fine-grained view of the evolution of the code. Of course, there will be code that will be newer, that will have fewer changes, 
But for, uh, as the code gets older, you get a more clear uh, view in terms of how the code gets to be uh, where it is. <clears throat> and just to recapitulate, and uh, so um, our original, uh, so our proposal essentially the ability to create uh, these view repositories. So if you give me a Git repo, I can create you a view, a view repo that uh, maps um, the files. Uh, we have two particular uh, examples of, of how to use them. One of them is tokenization. The other one is just tracing the declarations of the file. So in that case, uh, you are only concerned about who adds functions or, um, or global variables. And then the commit will only tell you that and nothing else. And um, so we, we, are also, we have been able to use it for that. Um, then I show you actually how we can use it to be able to have better traceability of, uh, of who is actually authoring code and um, with a more uh, uh, granular um, method. And finally, in conclusion that um, in the large, the counts, both of them are equivalent, but in the small, then you really get a much better uh, history of what's happening. Okay. And that's basically all. Thank you. Uh, questions? Uh, so your, your process right now, you take the repo, you create your, uh, your view repo, uh, and you have to do that reprocessing stuff. Mm -hmm. What are the barriers, or is it possible to build this feature into GIF and be able to do that view live? Yeah, it can be done. Because everything can be done in Git. Okay. Yeah. No, because we are just basically, uh, Originally, the way that we, use, that we develop it, uh, we started from scratch creating another repository. As we have understood what we're doing, we're able to go directly into the storage. And uh, so you can essentially add all of that. Yeah, so. Well, so one thing that Git, for example, does, Git itself as a project, as development, is that they use, they import repos of history when they add new features. Git K, for example. Git K started as its own project with its own author. And at some point, uh, Junior, I suspect, he said, oh, I like it. Can we have it? Rather than take just one single com uh, commit and put it all in, uh, he merged the repositories. So all the history that was before got added at the same time. I think that's actually the practice that uh, is not even thought about by the, te by, the, by the development teams when they are accepting contributions. And I think that many people just even know it's possible. I didn't know it until I started looking at this history. And uh, so essentially you can, you can bring the history of it somebody else and put it in, in as, your, uh, as part of your own. And if more projects do that, then uh, we will have better uh, granularity. The other alternative is what the many, many teams in the Linux kernel have done, which is archive the previous repositories. Because developers might not care for that, that history, but some people might care. And it's good to be able to say, this is the commit that added the code. What do I know about the commit? And then you go to, to the commit log and says, imported code from somewhere, and then you go to that somewhere. And did, you, did they jump? And that's something that, uh, uh, that I also uh, am very thankful for the Linux developers because their commit logs and also Git, their, com their commit logs are huge. So they give a lot of uh, context and information. And not every project is as good as that. So does that answer your question? Yeah, I think that's more about like different versions of the Good. Yeah. Say it again. Java? Yeah. Well, anything that we can parse into a tokenized version, and Java is the easiest language to, to, <laughs> to deal with. <laughs> so yeah, so. Uh, so Daniel, the ability to, to drill down to the provenance at the token level determination, what are the IP and legal ramifications of what cool stuff that you now see that aren't as much as further knowledge of where stuff came from? So it just adds information to 
to whatever the next step is. So this is kind of what I was mentioning about the facts. And then the, the job of, 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 of the courts is to find the truth, whatever that truth is. And this is just adding more information. So I think that there's a lot of analysis that needs to be done on top. That's right. So it's just, we're, we're, we're just removing layers, right? We're just, we're just removing layers and saying, here there is more information. Oh, here there is more information. Oh, look at this code. Oh, you thought it came from there? Uh uh, didn't come from there, come from all the way down there. Yeah, and, and I have, uh, I, and, and when you start looking at the, uh, at the aggregations, uh, those people start to become interesting. Uh, so it's Larry Finger. So Larry Finger is one of them. Larry Finger has a lot of commits in a very short period of time. So I thought, uh, what happened? So uh, my hypothesis, because I haven't talked to him, is that he's a proxy and, uh, for a company. And, uh, and then he uh, is the one that takes whatever development they have and puts it into uh, the Linux kernel. Yeah, so that's actually, I think that basically what we're saying is like, this is what Git gives you, yeah. but there's a lot more that you can add, and then it's a matter of actually connecting all that information. So I think that there's need for models and techniques, and uh, so, but yeah, this, we're basically saying, because there's more data, there's more potential. Yeah. Is your code available anywhere for review? So our goal is to publish that in the next three or four months. So that's for us the review. And as we publish it, then the tools become open source. And that's our goal, that everything that I have here uh, can be run by anybody. If any of you at this time has a project that um, doesn't have the scale of the Linux kernel, because the scale of the Linux kernel is mind boggling, and uh, I'll be happy to actually process it and give you uh, your token as uh, history to a certain point, okay? Any other question? Good, well thank you very much.